observer today. He's been driving for quite a long time today. Uh, Cheryl was saying there was a good amount of traffic on the road, and it was, it was just in Connecticut, but you kind of drove all over Connecticut, and you still have more to go. <laughs> so thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Jose B. Gonzalez is author of Two Made of Rock. He was born in El Salvador and immigrated to New London, Connecticut at the age of eight. He knew no English and now holds a PhD in English. He has presented at various college lectures, such as Harvard and Cornell University, countries including Mexico, Spain, and El Salvador, and institutions and organizations including the Smithsonian Museum of American History, the Smithsonian Museum of African Art. A Fulbright scholar, he has been a contributor to National Public Radio and has published poetry in journals such as The Queerest Review and Callaloo, and anthologies including Theater Under My Skin, Contemporary Salvadorian Poetry. He teaches Latino literature, creative writing, and composition, and speech courses at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy in New London. Thank you so much, Louis. Jesus 
the man I called my father would pick up a bottle of liquor on the way home, point to scabs on worn paths, slur something about defiant dreams, and sit and sin in the name of his absent father, his hungry son, and a holy ghost.
dirty gauzes. She brings home boxes of medical gauzes that serve as napkins, so we use them for wiping ketchup from the sides of our lips. We soak them in soap and scrub the sink. Our friends who are used to cockroaches crawling on lemonade glasses and climbing to the tops of popsicle sticks don't think twice about seeing the gauzes at our table. Night after night, the gauzes are lined up at mommy's factory. They're marked irregular. They're sentenced to a fire. But she saves them and stacks them like wood into her car so we can scar the floor stains. The evening that little brother is born, she's putting herself to sleep with dulce de leche when she feels her water break onto her kitchen floor. Be sure to clean up, she screams as the door is about to close, and she looks toward my sister and me and a stack of boxes. At the hospital, the doctor performs a cesarean section on mommy, who's ready to push and push and push, but is too small to give birth to such a large child born with a front belly. Dizzied by English words and Spanish screams, Bobby fills out forms and unintentionally gives mommy's baby name, or things, to the newborn. He's not the only one to make a mistake that night. Mommy screams for hours as if La Llorona had come and gone with infants in hand, while the nurses make hushing sounds as if all that's needed is a lullaby. As the sun cracks through her window, her screams shatter until a cleaning man, short with dusty dark hair, translates the pain for her and insists that there is something wrong with this woman. The doctor finds that wrong. Inside mommy's womb, an abandoned was so small that even after he performs emergency surgery and traps it in a jar, mommy's the only one who can tell that the gauze was stitched together in a painfully predictable pattern. All right, a musical one, Elvis in the Inner City, right? I was Elvis in the 70s, not swinging hips, not wearing suede shoes, but just the same and canvas Chuck Taylors with my own felt moves, spinning rap, scratching vinyl to the tunes of Curtis Blow, the Sugar Hell Gang, Grandmaster Flash, and the hip hop of the hibbity hip hip of other rappers, making rap mine, rhyming to the boogie, to the boom of the beat, beat, beat. Mom and Dad's charros, same as Lawrence Walk's instrumentals, were stuff of old country boletos, but I had my rap bebop and I'd rap, rap, rap. The other side of the city, like the flip side of a one-hit wonder, Bob Heads to Van Morrison, Jim Morrison, and Van Halen, but I couldn't break a pop to lyrics that weren't about me, inner city, inequality, in the record store I be. Boom boxes, size of refrigerators, walked up and down projects, giving concerts for free, and rap was made for me. Until I, a lone white square on a checkerboard, reciting amidst blacks of the block, froze, could not get my lips to vibrate, Sink the refrain, the sink the refrain of the word nigger. I, rockless, rapless, without a side A, nor a side B, studded, strutted, struggled to find someone who would rhyme with me. Locked. 
They want to chase the ghosts who left my classroom graveyard. They want to write on desks and mark the tombstones of the missing. I use hieroglyphics to mark their stories and gather eight sticks, eight sticks to build little men. But they too wind up hanged. All it takes is one missing letter and the sticks are damned. I shuffle my feet back and forth as if I'm kicking the water that is being drained. But my body just floats. There's no tide or wave to wash me ashore. But as I look toward the port, I see Mr. De Peter's chalked hand. He's holding a priest book by someone named Henry David Thoreau. On the corner, a picture of a pond. And just as my body is bracing itself to follow the dives of former classmates, the bro grabs the back of my shirt, drags me near his pond, and shows me the art of flipping book pages. Just a couple more here. Sociology 101, essay on illegal immigration. My words corralled inside the margins of a paper that described illegal immigration. Each sentence tried to follow a sign of guidelines. Research, the professor had said, is to come from public scholars, experts who had studied the impact of illegal immigration on this nation. They had uncles named Sam, while I had one named Eduardo. He crossed borders, but he had never conducted studies. What was I to do with him? Without a visa, without a visa, without immigration papers? He had become an expert on how to hire the right coyote. Having been hot tied by the migra in his first attempt, he grew eyes on the back of his head and learned that the trick to running is to sprint before starting pistol makes his first sound. He hurtled over the US-Mexico border on his second try and kept his feet going until he could no longer hear a coyote's howl or an immigration officer's growl. As hard as I tried to keep him from stepping foot in my paper, it was impossible to block him from running through the margins. The day I quoted him, Uncle Eduardo took away the job of a published researcher who was in this country legally, I was sure. As he described a three-week track from a bus station in El Salvador crossing the heart of rattling deserts to the mouth of Connecticut. My notes could not catch up with his words. He shifted through memories as if he was afraid of someone snatching them from him. And stacking my report on top of essays with alien titles, I could see the C that would eventually be placed on my cover page for allowing my uncle to trespass the same way I would the following semester an introduction to American literature where I raised my hand and uttered the lonely word, but. Yeah. I knew you were a really, really good talk. Anybody who associates themselves with John does that. <laughs> So this one is uh, one that I read re really quickly. It's called Autobiography of New England. You know, I like to wrap up with that one. Um, but I need a drink. A beautiful place, by the way, here. Only that is great.
you know, you've got grades, and, and, and if you're lucky, and, and you, you have a job if you're lucky, and then, and then, and then uh, on my end, you know, you, you look up and the hair is gone. So, how do run off the beat of a New England Latino? In 1967, San Salvador, El Salvador, fathered my brown, and so I was born in the capital that salutes the Pacific, the mother of so many brown rivers, lakes, ponds that held hands with volcanic rocks that tumbled brown, burned the soil brown, and brown the country in civil brown turmoil in the 1970s when my family left for New England where factories, my mother's sewing machine, my, and my father's spray paint machine were brown. And I first attended John Winthrop Elementary School, a school full of browns, a separate but equal type of brown that was not a Salvador brown, but a desperate to move out of the project brown. And so my parents poured their wages into tuition for a private middle school classroom where I was the only brown and I was taught to make my language a more subtle brown so that by the time I attended New London High School, which had chains of Puerto Rican brown and Tins of white American brown, I had shed so much brown that I was accused of not being enough brown. But I figured I knew the roots of my brown and felt comfortable enough with my brown, even if I was losing some of my Spanish brown. And I continued to lose it too, not because I wanted to, but because most of the brown, brown at, the co at the college I attended was a Republican brown which spoke a different dialect of brown. And by the end of my four years, my Spanish brown had faded so much that it became an anglicized Spanish brown, and I was awarded the college as excellent to English award, which I was pretty sure had never been given to a graduating brown. But when they said this year's recipient is Jose Gonzalez Brown, I could have sworn I saw hundreds of people scrape their ears in an attempt to fix whatever was making them here brown. And after graduating, I figured I'd, I'd get a job teaching English even if I was brown. But at an interview for an English teaching position at a small boarding school, a headmaster told me that if I was serious about getting a job, I teach Spanish brown because there's such a shortage of Spanish brown. To which I said, thank you, headmaster, but I just do not teach Spanish brown. And when his eyes said, thank you, Mr. Brown, but unless you're willing to teach Spanish brown, I won't have a job for you, Mr. Brown. I changed my mind, and I did what I had to, even in my first language, and it was no longer Spanish brown. And I taught there until one brown day in the middle of the school year. I just had to ask him, I know you hired me for something else, but someday can I teach English here? Even if, even if I am brown? And his office door replied with, if you didn't want to teach Spanish brown, maybe you should have been brown, which told me it was time for me to leave that master and get my master's, and I decided to attend what else? Brown. Yeah. 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 All right. And you, and you want to talk about a different shape? That was like a culture shock brown. <laughs> Mommy, help me, this is a bad novella. I've never seen this before, a kind of brown. And there were so many educated liberal browns. I thought that, that there had been some kind of going out of business clearance sale of diplomas for browns. Not that the majority was brown, but I just wasn't too used to associating the college experience with browns. So even a little bit of brown was enough to make me think that colleges were turning somewhat brown. And while at brown, I stood and taught at Providence's Hope High School which had many browns, so I wanted very badly for my students to recognize my browns and say, if he's, if he's that brown and he's brown, there's hope for us young browns. But they just thought I was brown, university brown, not inner city brown. And students couldn't see themselves in my brown, and so unaccustomed were they to seeing any shade of brown in front of their class that they thought it was impossible that I could be raised brown. But I didn't let that get me too much down. And when I graduate, graduated from brown, I became a brown brown, a brown squared, a brown times brown, which for some people, teachers even, only meant that I was highly brown because I am brown, which made me want to point to brown graduates who were brown because of their parents or, or grandparents were brown, making them legacy browns, browns cute. And I continued my schooling at the University of Rhode Island and worked toward my PhD because of, not in spite of being brown, and I studied literature that was brown because growing up, I had been assigned stories like Young Goodman Brown, but, but I had never been assigned a book by a brown author, which, which, which never made sense to me because I just knew that in all the years that Browns had been in the U.S., even in the part that was brown before the U.S. became the U.S., Browns had to have something to say, even if it wasn't about being brown. And while I worked on my brown dissertation, I taught English at Three Rivers Community College, which had quite a few Browns, so many of whom juggled coursework with family and jobs and being brown that it was tough for them to one day say, I have a college degree even though I'm brown, which made me appreciate being educated and being brown, and I became ABD, a brown doctor. <laughs> My brother became URI's first English PhD brown, which isn't that big a deal because in higher education, if you're brown, you can lay claim to being the first this and that is a brown. And that's why when I tell people that I'm a professor of English, every once in a while, some 
someone says something like Dr. Brown, you must teach a different type of English. <laughs> that, has to, that has to have some kind of Brown. Maybe you teach second language Brown English or remedial Brown English or <laughs> developmental English for the Brown because after all, you're Brown. <laughs> but it matters none to me, master of my, of my own Brown destiny, because even on the coldest, snowiest day in Connecticut, even when it seems I've been Brown beaten, I can still feel the power of my own brown. Brown like a brown beat the board of bed. Brown like a brown trunk of a brown tree that's been whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked, and whacked until it's become nothing but a strong brown wooden frame that holds a brown diploma high up in the air telling the world I'm educated and I'm brown. Yeah. Hey.
Come sisters, let me dance with you. I offer you a song. Let me paint it red with passion. You are all the women I have ever loved. Since I'm here, 
I would read one that I wrote recently for my sister. Um, she uh, and I grew up in central Massachusetts on Lake Winsigamon, and um, she moved to Connecticut when she got married about 40 years ago. Um, and now works in Greenwich, Connecticut, which you know is like that wealthy town. Um, but she is a conservation director. Um, so this is a poem to my sister Denise. This is the place my sister gets to say no to movie stars. You can't drain the wetlands so you can have sheep. Where TV personalities let their poodles out into the jaws of coyotes and journalists come and interview my sister and she becomes a national coyote expert for the day. Her image on the screen reassuring the six foot joggers afraid they will be eaten by carnivores on the roads of Connecticut. This is the place my sister has found bigger than the island of Sigmund where we grew up, where she knew every cove and water hole. This is the place where her husband has turned her backyard into a sanctuary where he counts birds every day, enters numbers into the computer. He is not the only one. Somewhere a student is making sense of all the cardinals and chickadees, the six grackles and four morning doves. The hawk, quiet in the old oak, is interested too, though I doubt she counts before she dives. In this place, my sister might be out under the full moon, up to her thighs in the waters of the sound, to count horseshoe crabs at mating time. Or she is in the kitchen cooking rice with basil and dried cranberries, stew from the just dug oysters. This is the place where her husband records the songs of frogs in the swamp, calls her on his cell phone and says, listen to this. Here is the town hall where she talks and fights and cajoles and takes back the land, one estate, one beach at a time. Today, we take our grandchildren to the fishway, where glass eels as thin as spaghetti climb the ropes over the dam. Cormorants dive, a pair of swans gaze into the falls, lean into the spray like children into a sprinkler. Out on the island, the herrings are building nests. The herring are running, a red-tailed hawk circles. Getting some respect. <laughs> 
I'm always interested in how family stories um, change as you get older. This is a poem called Los Andos, and it was a musical term, and Los is when you uh, hit all the notes along, so you hit the notes individually, but your, your voice just slides over them. So Los Andos, you probably couldn't hear anything if I was moving on. <laughs> moving this mic everywhere. Aunt Louise is screened in the summer house is the place we like best to sit, my sister and I, watching the boats out on the lake, swinging on a porch swing that has soft pillows and creaks gently. Next to the swing is a stack of Playboy magazines that my mother doesn't know is there. We think it's funny that Uncle Raymond buys these magazines full of naked women, funny that they even exist, but nevertheless, we turn the pages, looking at one woman after another, as we push the floor with our feet, swinging harder, lying back on pillow, pillows as we giggle and point. We think of Aunt Louise, way older than my mother and barrel-shaped, her Sunday dress and wide-brimmed hats, her voice a glissando over the high notes of the hymns. She would never be in one of these magazines. She is tight-lipped angry when she finds us with the pile of them open around us, our skin flushed from swinging and looking. But later, I hear family stories about a party long ago, a few too many drinks, and Aunt Louise's breast set free from her tight brassiere, swinging, round, loose, and perfect, glistening with sweat, glissandos of motion to the tinkling piano's ragtime beat. So I thought today, I don't know, I was just in the mood to read a bunch of poems that are sort of vaguely about sex. Um, this one's called Waiting for Feathers. They were always blue, Ma's parakeets, always male, ready to bite your lip, pick at your glasses, and chatter to the piano, or the voice of Johnny Most announcing the subject's game. We waited for them to appear, black and deep violet, the necklace of feathered jewels. Pretty boy, we all said, pretty boy. My father called them the family jewels, laughed as the bird perched on his finger. Later, when I knew the phrase referred to something else, something to do with young men, I waited and watched, eager for the exalted plumage. He was a kid. He used to stand under the drain pipe at school um, and got taken to the office numerous times for it. And anyway, he grew up to love jazz, and so somehow I put that together in my head. And this is for the boy standing under the drain pipe. <laughs> he is wearing a fisherman's raincoat, a floppy rain hat with a long back brim, or he is not. He is the boy standing under the drain pipe in the full gushing waterfall. His eyes are closed, his head lifted into the full flow, or they are open wide under the protective brim of his hat, watching the heavy streams unfold him. He is the boy standing under the drain pipe, and I am the girl watching. He is always there, in spite of teachers, principals, trips to the office. It rains, and he finds the way to where water falls dirty from the roof. Muddy water plays over him, and where he stands with his hands outstretched or by his side, where he spins or stands still or circles slowly, it is all he hears, the gushing voice of water, the staccato notes on the shoulder and chest. It is the flowing, the streaming, the warm or icy notes, their embrace. So there's another one of these um, concrete poems, um, and you, you can't see it, I would, I would put it up, I don't, I don't think you can, you can't see it. Um, maybe you can, can you see it? Okay. So uh, this is called bread, and it's actually a woman's body rising from a bread bowl. So, because. <clears throat> it is the warm white loaves rising in willow baskets in your winter kitchen. 
yellow walls promising sun. It is the bread, the living breath of it under my kneading hands, the yeasty smell of it hot off the stone, the round goodness of it pressed to my face. It is the taste of warm bread I want between my lips, new as a love affair, familiar as mother's milk on my tongue. Ah, uh, but this is no milk for an eat, no meal for an infant. There is garlic here, onion, scallion, and sage, basil, and the memory of olives basking in hot sun. Sweet anise lives in this bread, dark chocolate, and the scent of espresso drunk after midnight. This bread holds the briny taste of sea, of shrimp and salt, butter and lemon, of honey, almonds, and cognac. Ah, uh, I could get drunk on this bread. Bring me your blue bowl and wooden spoon. Bring me your loaves warm to the touch and tender of the tongue, the sweet, yeasty promise of tomorrow's bread. So one of the things I have found is in my life is that my gender identity is very fluid, depending on who. <laughs> Thank you. Depending on who I'm with. So this one is called You Bring Out the Butch in Me. I want to lift weights, display my arms, throw out underwires and wear a white ribbed tank t-shirt. I want to carry a wrench, drive a truck, cover you with roses. I want to order artichokes and lemon and watch the olive oil darken your lips. I want to wear a velvet jacket and I, the heart-shaped ruby pendant, nestled between your breasts. I want to look at you, look at you, look at you. I want to watch you put on lipstick. I want to open doors, do all the driving, walk on the outside of sidewalks. I want to wear leather, strut in Doc Martens, twirl you around a dance floor. I want you to know when I love you that you've been loved. Yeah. This one is called Deep Winter, Northampton. I wanted to kiss your neck in the middle of traffic, but instead I just brushed your cheek. We've been eating Greek food, avgo lemono, moussaka, hot flatbreads with olive oil and feta. I wanted to kiss you then in falling snow, bring on an early thaw. Um, you mentioned being 15. So I, it reminded me of this poem I wrote, I wrote uh, in which I am 15 at one point. Side pass. Now my father's eyes are closed, and the boys, now men, file by, giving their hands to each of us, their eyes touching our faces, each in turn. For weeks I think of the boy, his first love lost 20 years ago, who shows up at my father's wake, with all the others who called my father coach. My curly-haired Italian boy is this man with diabetes and bad teeth. I can't get him off my mind. I am humming as I iron this blouse, pink like the one he bought me when I was 15. I search through bureau drawers with a tiny box that holds the old necklace, a single pearl and a white gold chain so thin it tangles as I lift it from the tissue paper. I am crazy. He is married with a new child. He doesn't read. I am happy with my husband, but I am like a girl waiting for the phone. I am daydreaming in love. I am 15. My father's hands are holding the ball in a circle of sweating boys. His eyes are not closed, but on their faces, moths are circling the lights above the court, and I am watching this unlikely teen as he flicks his wrists in a direction he isn't looking. One of them catches the ball. They break into a run down the court. I am watching, breathless, 15. I would fall in love again if it would save me from this grief. So I want to read a couple of new poems um, that I um, have recently written as part of a memoir that's sort of part poetry, part poetry, um, and it's about bipolar disorder. Uh, so, 
I guess it started when I was in my 20s, but I never knew it, and I wasn't diagnosed till I was 55. So to try to look back and make sense of my life, like through this new lens, was uh, kind of interesting. Uh, so this is called Jungle Road. I am driving home from night class down what my son will later call Jungle Road because of how the trees loom, the way their branches hang over the car as we drive, the calls of jays, the drones of cicadas. That is years ahead of us. Tonight I am driving home alone. It is late. The high beams wave back and forth with the curves. The trees are dark. If I turn off the lights, I will be lost in them. I am driving fast, taking each curve way to the outside, and I come to the walls. Walls made of stone and brick that line the road just before it opens out into the bright lights of Route 20. I think it would be so nice to drive into that wall, that one there, the old-fashioned stone wall without mortar. I could just rip right through and be done with it. But at the last minute, I turn. I think of my son sleeping in his crib. He expects me in the morning as sure as sunrise. I turn the wheel. I come to a full stop before entering traffic. I use my blinker before a turning left onto the island. I drive down the dirt road. I make it home. So one of the things that happened to me in my life <laughs> was I could never keep a job, you know? I was in a job for six months, eight months. Um, I would end up not with, you know, not having a job. The job I kept for the longest was um, poet in schools because then I'd be like in a school for six weeks or two days and I could, I could handle that. Um, so this is a, it, it, I didn't realize that this is something really common to people with bipolar. You don't know why, everyone tells you you're an idiot and you kind of believe them when you can't keep a job. It starts with a quote by Neil Young. He tried to do his best, but could not. When you can't keep a job, when panic attacks send you to the restroom several times a day, when people spritzing their desks with Windex or talking loud or walking by enrages you, when someone moves your Kleenex box and you feel attacked, when you rearrange the entire accounts payable files according to some new system only you can see the merits of, when the lights hurt your eyes and you put on sunglasses, when you bang your fist on the time clock, when you throw off your apron during lunch rush and walk, cursing through the restaurant on your way out the door, when you hesitate, when you forget your train of thought, when your students ask you if you're okay, when you know you're not okay, when you try to do your best, but cannot. And so this next one is um, actually the poem that began the memoir. And um, it came about because someone told me that uh, there was actually a name for all these woods that grew back after they cut down all the mother forests. Um, and that we, uh, the, what we call them is crazy books. And that just stayed with, with me and um, became the beginning of the book. So this is Crazy Woods. It's in several parts. It is what we call them, those places grown back after the forest was cut down. Crazy woods, and we walk crazy among them. Trees grow every which way, undergrowth is thick and sometimes stops all progress. There are brilliant berries in the crazy woods on vines that choke the trees, but still our eyes are caught. We take them home to dress the mantle, hang them on doors. Next year they will grow thick in some new spot or from old stumps we've hacked. They should be gone, but in spring we find them covered with bees and here to stay. Two. The trees are small in the crazy woods and spindly. Everything is whispering. Where are the elms? Where are the chestnuts? What's happening to the maples? What's happening to the dogwood? The earth burns our feet. White pines reach out, extend their healing arms, and small birches grow at the edges, leaning towards sun. Oaks are plentiful, though there are no mother trees here, wider than we are tall. 
There are pricker bushes, but where are the berries? Which of these mushrooms can I eat? Which roots will cure wounds? Which kill? Avoid them all then. Become afraid of everything. In spring, puddles and pools fill these woods. Orange salamanders crawl in the dark, following water. Pretty. I follow water. Those creative bursts, that episodic joy, the world full of exuberant meaning, those moments when I remember the world with my old eyes. Four. You have to be a little bit crazy to live in the crazy woods. You have to look through the eyes of the old ones. You have to sing. You have to call the names. You have to greet the wind. You have to throw back your head and howl. You have to moan. You have to growl. You have to sharpen your claws. You have to be a little bit crazy. Five. If I hear voices, if I see visions, if I don't play well with others, if I need silence and trees and water and the sounds of birds, the snap of beaver tails, if stories and song are what come from my lips when I am not sleeping like a bear or roaring like a cougar, will they call me crazy? Six. It is a slow process becoming human. This pulling back, this trimming of nails. She will roar softly, use words instead of a paw to backslap. She will keep her lumbering ways, eat salmon and blueberries whenever she can get them, sleep when she pleases, wail, sometimes sing.